Good afternoon. I'm Steve Schlisky, the Programs and Activities Chair of the local chapter of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Our chapter has been doing monthly Zoom casts on a variety of subjects, uh, but today we've been really looking forward to this one, uh, presenting the first of what we hope to be a series of programs focusing on what works for the media professionals in our chapter. We are fortunate to have two talented MMJs uh, who have helped define the craft in our chapter. We'll meet them in a moment, but first I would like to introduce our chapter president, Randy Forsman. Hi, Steve. Thank you. Welcome to everybody, all of our members and any non-members uh, joining us this morning, uh, this afternoon. Uh, but yes, my name is Randy Forsman. I am the president of the uh, San Francisco, Northern California chapter of NATUS, which is the National Academy of Television Arts and Scientists, Sciences. I would say that wrong. Our chapter covers not only San Francisco, but Sacramento, Hawaii, Fresno, Reno, Chico, Redding, Eureka, Monterey, Salinas, and also Guam. We currently have nearly 1,300 members. Uh, we are more than just the Emmy Awards. We also do the Gold and Silver Circle. We do high school student production awards and college scholarships. So on that, I would like to introduce uh, Nazi Javid. She is our cha current chapter secretary and news director and anchor at North Coast News at KAEF in Eureka. Nazi, take it away. Thank you, Randy, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for coming today. We're so excited about this. Uh, again, my name is Nazi Javid. I serve as a governor and an officer for Natus SF, and I am the news director and evening news anchor here in Eureka. We wear many hats. Um, we here in Eureka, I'll tell you a little bit about us. We've got a total of 10 team members here. That's me. We have two anchor reporters, two multimedia journalists, uh, one producer, three production assistants, a technical director, a creative services producer, and an engineer. So we're a small team, but we get a lot done. We are in Humboldt, the Emerald Triangle. Um, we also cover Del Norte and Trinity and Mendocino counties. Um, we are about five hours north of San Francisco. Our small newscast was nominated uh, for an Emmy back in 2018 for our coverage of the campfire. Um, and I have one open MMJ position that I'm actively recruiting for. I had to throw it out there. I'll drop a link in chat uh, for anyone who may want to send an application in later or share it with someone you know. Um, and with that, I will send it over to Riley Carroll, the San Francisco chapter's nominating committee chair. She is also one of my MMJs here in Eureka. Hi, Riley. Hi, Nazi. Thank you so much. I just wanted to say a quick hello. Like Nazi said, my name is Riley. I'm an MMJ in Eureka. This is my first job, my first news job, and I'm learning so much. It's a wonderful place to be. And um, I recently joined the Board of Governors for Natus. And you'll just see me popping up in the chat, helping to facilitate some question and answers later on. Thanks, Riley. We'll send it over to Shane Calvert, who also serves as a governor on the board. He's from our sister station, KRCR, and who represents the Chico Reading Market. Um, Shane, can you tell us more about your market and position? Hey, hello from the road. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today and thanks for getting my invite, those of you who joined. Uh, I am representing the Chico Reading market. We have roughly, give or take, sometimes over 10 MMJ positions covering Chico Reading, uh, along with you know a full news and TV crew production of um, commercials, promotions department, and I represent the promotions and commercial production department. So I'm really more on the promotions end, working with all of our MMJs. I don't work alone because when I'm out with the team, I'm, I'm with the MMJs. And part of that is shooting promotions and then be also as a treat and be like, hey, let's do a stand up because you guys are alone all the time. So we'll try to have fun and do that. But um, it's, it's a great little market. we got a lot of talented people here. So thank you guys for joining Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Shane. And uh, we're going to toss it over to Chris Carpenter now out of CSU Monterey Bay here to tell us more about his position with the board, the university and the Monterey Salinas TV market. Hi, Chris. Yeah, hi. Uh, so my name is Chris Carpenter. I work at CSU Monterey Bay in the Cinematic Arts uh, Department. And um, I worked in television for many, many years in the local market. And I am the Monterey Salinas rep. Um, I definitely uh, am excited about uh, this this forum and and you know having some of my students who are here uh, get to know uh, more about what's going on as well as seeing some of our local reporters as well. So it's uh, great to to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, and without further ado, the guest speakers you've all been waiting to meet: KPIX multimedia journalists Dalin and Devin Feely. Where you at? Give us a wave. 
Hello, hello. Thank you guys so much for making time to be here with us today. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of bio behind each uh, one of these amazingly talented journalists. Uh, Dalin is an award-winning journalist at KPIX5 uh, News in the Bay Area. He joined KPIX in 2012, um, but has been reporting the news in the Bay Area since 2007. Is that right? And Dal grew up in, yes, in the Bay Area. From the Bay Area. He grew up in Oakland. Before his return to the Bay Area, he spent five years uh, covering the news at three other TV stations in Texas, Southern, and Central California. He also spent five years reporting at Cron in San Francisco, as you heard him mention there. And his coverage of major stories, including the Oscar Grant killing, has earned him 10 awards from the Bay Area Press Photographers Association and the Northern California Radio and Television News Directors Association. We also have a quick look at some of his work. Check it out. When it comes to crime and safety, Oakland is a tale of two cities. We're on Lake Merritt, the heart of Oakland. To my right, downtown, uptown, West Oakland, and all the way up to the hills. Police say in the first 11 months, all of those areas, 12 homicides. To my left, East Oakland, 88 homicides. The farther east you go, the more shootings and killings. Here's a map of East Oakland. 2020, many say it's the worst year. A lot of death and destruction. But the Bay Area is resilient and there are still a lot of good things happening. Let's end this year on a positive note. I'm setting up shop at Garadelli Square. Asking people, what's your good news? Our big good news is this little guy. He was born in August. Incredible work. Just amazing. Um, you know, speaking of talent, we have incredible talent with us. Also, Devin Feely is a guest speaker. He's an uh, Emmy Award winning general assignment reporter at MMJ for KPIX5 as well. And before joining KPIX, Devin was at WXIA in Atlanta, where he spent four years reporting. During that time, he won a ton of awards, including three Murrow Awards and the Gannett Foundation Award for Innovation in Investigative Journalism from the National Association of Black Journalists for a series of stories that helped free a wrongfully convicted man. Prior to that, Devin reported for WAGA in Atlanta, WDSU in New Orleans, KSBW8 Monterey, and KNTV in San Jose. And we have a peek at Devin's incredible work. The winds are definitely here. The fire is spreading now downhill. We're looking at uh, 80, 90 mile an hour winds. This is the story of how we ended up in a tiny kayak on the open ocean, a vast sea of blue north of Santa Barbara. It's got a lot to do with this breathtaking beach, a sandy, unspoiled slice of California's coast that you've probably never heard of and almost certainly by design have never stepped foot on. Male's role is very macho. And the women portray exactly the opposite, a very submissive role. If Five Wounds Church is the beating heart of San Jose's Portuguese community, the close-knit neighborhoods that surround it are the arteries, through which the lifeblood of faith and family and tradition flow. Unbelievable stuff there, guys. Just incredible. Give me the goosebumps. Of all times. A lot of serious talent in the Zoom room today, so we are not going to waste any time. We're going to jump into our questions, which range from pitching to time management and creative active stand-ups. Um, as you just saw, our guests have sample links to their work also on standby to show us how it works. So Don, Devin, thank you for being here. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we all know that 2020 brought challenge, um, but it also brought innovation. And as we leap into this year, we're hoping that you too might share your wealth of knowledge with us, your secrets, because you guys have seen it all and you know what works. 
And for our participants, um, you can please feel free to drop your questions into the chat. If a question pertains to the topic of discussion, Riley Carroll will chime in and share your question to get that answered for you. And if you have something maybe unrelated to the topic, we will get your question answered for the back end of this call. So we have some set questions that we'd like to start with, but we are gonna follow where they go. So the first things first, um, we're in the COVID era, as restrictions start to loosen and things start getting back to normal, what we wanted to know was maybe some of the hacks that you both learned during the pandemic that you intend to keep around. Obviously, and, and the reason why I have a wide shot is I'm gonna move around a little bit, guys, and hopefully you guys can still hear me okay? Okay, so you, you had a lot to begin with, right? Before the, the COVID era. Um, this is how I typically, you know, I have a, a strap to my camera. This is how I roll. Uh, tripod, right? You know, just uh, right here. And typically, one more time here. So I, I don't like to, I know some of my colleagues, they have a belt or a fanny pack um, to care about the gear. <laughs> I, like, I like to keep it very simple because I like to be mobile and moving. So this typically is just right behind here, my belt. And, uh, and I'm just going to do this. And this is typically my kind of how I typically go around talking to folks. I typically have a jacket on, white shirt right before the live shot, change it out very quickly. I'll show you guys my van very briefly uh, later on. Uh, change into a suit and tie, put some powder, powder man action as I like to call it, and just kind of move forward. Now with uh, COVID, uh, I have this. Um, typically I like to use a lav mic, uh, sometimes stick mic, but mostly before COVID I used a lav mic. I like to just uh, mic it up to them so I can follow them a little bit aside from the interview. But now with COVID, I got a little mic stand right here, you know, set it up right before them and then stay about six, seven feet back. And then typically in my back pocket and my side pocket, I would have uh, maybe a bottle of small sanitizer and then wipes on my side pocket to wipe down the mic after each interview. So it's made things a little more difficult, more things to, to carry around, but I, that's how I typically work. And I hope you guys, especially the folks who are already working, uh, you know, we're a year into this, hopefully you guys already have a system in place. Um, so that is my typical setup um, to try to keep myself, obviously the mask and all that stuff and constantly, um, you know, washing your hands and using your uh, hand sanitizer, uh, knock on wood got a piece of little wood right here, um, you know, but kept me safe so far, the little system that I have in place, no COVID, none of that stuff. So, um, so that is my typical setup. Um, Devin, I'll, I'll let you uh, continue. Yeah. So I would just say that, you know, throughout this time, I mean, there was, there was a point at which where we were doing a lot of our stuff from home. So we were doing a lot of Zooms. I know that I, I, prior to the pandemic, I don't know if I was ever on a Zoom, not even once, I don't think. <laughs> Um, and, and so kind of my setup evolved a little bit over, over time. Initially, foolishly, I didn't really know how to sort of natively record on, on, the, Zoom, uh, on, on the Zoom website. So I was doing things where I was setting up like the, you know, either the phone on a stand and filming it and then, you know, pushing it into like a, a graphic and using it that way sort of early on. But now, you know, like our station... Here in the Bay Area, some of the stations have had reporters that have not left their house in a year, and they still report from home. Our station, for better or worse, has really kind of been in the forefront and kept, you know, their people in the field, empowered them to sort of take whatever precautions they felt were necessary. But we've kind of been in the field. And so that setup that Da showed you where you've got the, you know, the camera on the tripod and then maybe a microphone stand that might be 10 or 15 or even 20 feet away um, is something that I think that a lot of us use. And I kind of like it for a couple of reasons during this time. I mean, there was, there was a point in which people didn't really feel comfortable being up close. I mean, you're normally within arm's length of somebody as you're doing an interview. And there was just a time when that was, you know, I think just wasn't socially acceptable. People didn't really feel comfortable. So I would set it up probably 10 or 15 or maybe even further away, feet away, and one of the things that when you when you when you space those two things out, the interviewee and, and the camera, you can kind of control depth of field, which is something I kind of just like aesthetically. But you can also tell people if they feel comfortable, they can lower their mask because you're standing like 15 or 20 feet away from them. 
And usually, it to me, it looks better. You can hear them a little more clearly, and so that's kind of how I've 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 done it. You know, but it's been something that's evolved throughout the course of the pandemic. You know, with what people feel comfortable with. Do you feel that? like things are getting, journalists are getting complacent with all these virtual interviews and that we're going to be going in this direction of like, I mean, it used to be like, oh no, a, a virtual interview, a phone or like, we don't do phoners. Where are we going? What do you think? So I kind of think Zoom is, is, is with us for a while. Now, if there was, if there was a story that I was, you know, like, some of the examples of the stuff that you saw, if there was a story that I was really trying to do an in-depth story, I would probably try to avoid a Zoom, if only for the fact that you give up a lot of control over, over what that interview is ultimately going to look like. Because if you're doing it remotely, you're not putting lights up, you're not you know, cho- you know, choosing sort of your focal length or your depth of field or any of the things that you have the ability to do when you're in person. So I think that it's probably here to stay. If it was something that was really consequential, I would try to do it in person myself. But I think that there's a, there's a, there's a tolerance, there's an acceptance of Zoom because it's become so ubiquitous. You know? So I think it's gonna be a mix, but I think that if possible, and if it's for a story that's really important, um, I would just urge you to try and do it in person if you can. I think it's mixed blessings, right? I mean, uh, I personally try to avoid Zoom interviews because think about it, guys. We're in the TV business. It's a visual business. Zoom can only do so much, and visually it's not very attractive. So I try to go to the person if the person obviously is comfortable. But I think what Zoom has opened up is there were many stories in the past where we're like, oh, the person is out of state. The person's not available right now. He's out of town or he can't meet with us to do the interview. It's opened that door up. Now we can actually do those interviews. Oh, you're, you're in, um, you know, Utah. Okay, we can do the interview. Do you have a computer or a cell phone? Yeah, okay, we can do it now. I mean, so that's opened up those stories that in the past we weren't able to do. Now we can do it if it's an important. You know, I classified, and this is kind of going back to reporting. Needs and wants, guys. When you guys are looking at your story, what are the need interviews? And then what are the want interviews? The need interviews, you have to have those interviews to be to have a package. And then the want interviews are the interviews that can make you, okay, that went from a, a decent story to a really good story or a good story to an Emmy winning piece. So um, so in a lot of our pieces, you know, you have the need interviews. If you can, if the need interview is not available, but only by Zoom, then yeah, you, you do it. So I, I hated Zoom interviews. <laughs> Uh, so I didn't do a whole lot of reporting from home. I, I try to go out um, for the most part, even at the beginning of uh, the pandemic. And and I was just grabbing my lob. I In the past, I used lob pretty much, I would say, 90%. Like I said, I like to, not just the interview, but as they're going around doing things, I want to be able to get some that sound, that pops, them doing whatever they're doing. And so I, I'm looking forward, maybe uh, the start of next year, I'll probably start to mic them up with the the lob uh, mic set. Um, but now I, I strictly just do uh, my little um, mic stand over there. So, so yeah. And, and you know, uh, it, it's not a question that you guys are asking, but I just want to just kind of go back to what I was telling Nazi and, and Riley and everybody else. So um, Devin and I have very two different styles, as you guys saw there. He is the longer form man. He, he shoots some of the most beautiful pictures you'll ever see, right? Um, there's a couple of examples I hope he'll show later on uh, of how he edits and how he shoots. And it, it's like uh, magic. And I, I don't know how he does it, um, but it's very creative. My creativity is in the shorter form, kind of like how I, you know, set up. I do a lot of improvising, like, you know, I, uh, short story. I have a baby upstairs, so uh, there, there isn't a whole lot of room uh, to do. To, to do like walking and talking and all that stuff. So got a little gym downstairs, there's a window in the back. So I just kind of taped it off with a cloth that's for my work van. So I do a lot of improvising, a lot of just like creative standups to get it going. Uh, one is because I think sometimes news can be kind of boring. Okay, that sound, track, 
sound track. It just gets really boring. And I just want to mix it up. And so I, I use sequences to create movement um, just to make it look a little different. But at the when it's all said and done, it's about creativity. And Devin is also very creative. So it's two different forms of creativity. And so that is something that we're hoping you guys can learn uh, briefly. I know it's very short, um, but but you know we're hoping that you can see that there's a shorter form of creativity and then the longer form of creativity. Okay, I'll let you. I'll go back to you now. And, and let me just echo what Da was saying. I, I mean, I think one of the things that I really kind of want to communicate to this group because this is something about people that that shoot and edit their own stuff, right? And I think that there's kind of a tendency to sort of feel that you are somehow diminished. Um, you know, if you're a one-man band or an MMJ or that you're somehow less than a two-person crew. And one of the things that I really just kind of want to underscore, and I'll come back to this at the very end, that creativity and artistry, I think, is within reach, even if you're doing it yourself. And kind of, I, I told Da this the other day, I, I feel like kind of the, the sort of the, the common denominator or the nexus between what he and I do, because you can see stylistically we're very different. But I think that we're both trying to be really creative. Now, Daw has said that he kind of likes to do his stuff within the four corners of his day. He doesn't want a project that starts on Wednesday and finishes next Monday. Um, and, and I completely, completely understand that. And so he really sort of shoehorns so much creativity into the eight or nine hours that he's, that he's working. Uh, and I was just saying that I kind of come at it from probably 180 degrees different. I'm looking for opportunities to sort of take something off the day wheel so that I can sort of dig into that story and not have the constraints that often, you know, deadlines and, and time constraints kind of impose on you. But I think that the destination is the same. It's to be really creative, but I think the paths there are just different. So our first question from Anna, she wants to know, um, you were talking about microphones, Da, and your your stick mic. How often do the two of you include man on the street in your packages? Oh, very often. Uh, let me show you a very quick creative piece. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so, okay, so I, I do about five, roughly five a year of these I call uh, sequences to create movement um, pieces. Uh, just because a lot of the stories, they, they just won't work with this method. Um, he also calls them Emmy winners. That's their other name. <laughs> yeah, she can say that too. Actually, there, there have been times that people hate them too. So uh, they're, they're not automatic. But um, I do about five of these because they have to be numbers. They're very heavy with numbers. And also, I don't need sound bites because I, I spend a good chunk of my day trying to line up interviews. But if I don't need to line up interviews, then it saves me a lot of time. I, I typically have an idea you know, how I want to pitch my story the day before, like, okay, this is a story I can do. Um, so I typically don't have interviews in, in these creative standups. But then when I do go heavy on these, uh, like interviews, man on the street, Anna, this is what I do. So I'll show you a quick one uh, very quickly here. Well, we're nearing the end of the year of the pandemic. It's one many would like to forget, but 2020 wasn't all bad. Oh, KPX 5's Don Lynn started this segment two years ago, and he is back at it again, asking folks all over the Bay Area, what is your good news? 2020, many say it's the worst year. A lot of death and destruction. But the Bay Area is resilient, and there are still a lot of good things happening. Let's end this year on a positive note. I'm setting up shop at Garadelli Square, asking people, what's your good news? Our big good news is this little guy. He was born in August, and he's just brought so much joy and love into our home. And then around the same time, uh, we also moved to the East Bay and bought a home. It's exciting. Never thought it would happen, but it, it did. And uh, I started my own practice, which is great too. My good news is that this year I got my black belt at Vision Martial Arts after five years of hard work. What's your good news? I got a job promotion. Uh, my parents celebrated their 35th wedding anniversary. 
started off college this year doing online school and I managed to get a 4.0. I go to my new preschool and I made a friend named Miko. I survived COVID-19. Um, I, I contracted it as well as me and my family and we all went through it smoothly and safely. We got engaged this year. I proposed to him, actually. <laughs> we're thinking May 6th, 2023. We didn't want a coronavirus wedding, so we're trying to wait it out. What's your good news for 2020? My good news is I'm halfway through my master's program, and I'm actually here on a scholarship, and I am able to have my little sister come visit me. I'm from El Paso, Texas. I haven't seen her in a while. We're very close, so it's the best feeling ever, seeing her. We both, both got an Exhibiting Excellence Award and, and Student of the Month at Silver Oak School in, in San, San Jose. Jose. Nice. I'll end this story with some great news of my own. My wife and I just had our first child. We're blessed he's healthy and active. I hope this holiday season you'll have some great news and some inspiring stories to share with your family. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year from San Francisco's Garadelli Square. I'm Don Lynn, KPIX5. Uh, that was a piece where it was all MOSs, right? Um, uh, the drone was shot by Devin, actually. I was like, hey, Devin. I think I called him the night before. It's like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to doing what uh, I've done it, uh, you know, in the past. And so I was like, I'm going to go back to doing what's my good news. Can you uh, show up uh, whatever time you can? And, and he, he does the anchoring uh, weekend mornings. And so uh, right after his uh, morning shift. Before he goes on to shoot his package, uh, he came and shot that uh, a drone shot for me before I started all of that stuff. So, so that's an example of how, you know, hey, if you're going to get a bunch of MLSs, get me something creative. Get a creative way of shooting it. Uh, I have, um, aside from my camera, um, you know, I have a couple of old used cameras. So you got a couple of, uh, uh, you know, these, uh, that camera, I have two of those. And then I got a bunch of GoPros. Um, I'm gonna bring a couple up. Uh, it's a little good investment, you know, like uh, I got about, I got uh, three of these that initially one broke down. So I got two left now. So it's a, it's a good way to, to get different angles and be creative with the fisheye lens. Um, your station's gonna give you what you need to uh, crank out stories. But if you want to do good stories, you gotta do your own little investment uh, to look at what gear is good for you, what, what's, um, uh, you know, what are some of the things that you need to make things better for, for your uh, story? So, um, that's, that's great. If I may really quick, actually Da and Devin about that last story. Um, someone's asking when you're getting, obviously you've got a whole range of people for your, uh, that MOS story. What's your good news? What is the best technique for getting people to talk to you for MOS stories? You know, sometimes, I, I mean, I will tell you quite honestly at our station, um, we often have to do MOS. I think we often do it sort of with a groan because our news director, I presume who is not listening, will say, will say, we need some real people in these stories today. And he will kind of make that a point of emphasis. And so, um, you know, I think Dawes story that he kind of highlighted really showcases a story in which the MOS really is the story. It's the heart of it. It's not something that's just kind of peripheral that you have to get and then you just kind of put into it. Um, but I, I, always, I always think that, uh, you know, what, what I always tell people when they're nervous is don't rehearse it. It's not live. Don't develop a script in your head because you're not going to be able to deliver it perfectly. Think of it like a conversation. And then I try my best to sort of engage that person and tell them, forget about the camera. Let's just talk for a little bit. And just trust me that I'm going to choose the best six, seven, eight seconds of it. And usually that technique, you know, that technique works. Now, sometimes with MOS, you just have to ask a lot of people, you know, sometimes. And those are the days that we kind of, as reporters, sort of groan a little bit. And we're like, ah. Oh. And you end up asking a dozen people to get two people that says yes. But it's just something that you have to do. I mean, it's just part of the job. And sometimes you, you know. Somebody walks up to you and says, hey, what, what are you doing? And they become the perfect person and it's very easy. But sometimes it's just the volume game. And I think to just try and keep that person from developing a script yeah. and just talk to you. Because then it's going to be organic and real and it's, and it's going to feel spontaneous. Yeah, I, at my station, I'm kind of known as an MOS machine because uh, I've known Duff for a while. 
and I'm a very casual speaker to people, um, as he knows. Some, <laughs> so um, I found out a lot that what frightens people is the camera. So what I'll do is I'll put the camera down to and by my side. Obviously, they know because I'm wearing something from the station or whatever that I'm a reporter. And I'll ask him the question, what do you think of this or what do you think of that? And then I'll ask him, that sounded great. Can you say that on camera? Because I find that 90% of people that don't want to do it are just embarrassed that they're going to say something stupid on camera. So if they know they talk to you and it's a good response, most times, because it's off the cuff, they can say it again. And they're willing to say it because they know they didn't say something stupid. So because they're already in line with it, it really works really well for me. And I've had other people try that and it worked well for them as well. So. And I think Nazi brought up a good point in the chat uh, section, having a set. And that's what I did. Um, I had a set out over at the Gary Daly Square location. Uh, it's typically a well-traveled area anyway during the pandemic. It's kind of slow. So it was pretty easy for me to just ask folks, hey, I know it's been a tough year. You want to tell us, you know, if there's anything good that happened in your life in 2020? And, you know, uh, I would say it was a kind of like a 50, uh, I would say more of it's like a 70. 30, 70% said, no, I don't want to be on TV and then 30%. So I asked quite a few, um, but it was pretty easy. You know, I had my setup, spent uh, an hour setting everything up, making sure everything was good. Um, so yeah, once you have a good setup, that's very easy. Pamela was asking, does your uh, station provide editing equipment? Um, yes, um, it, we use Edius, Um, And I don't know what you guys use for us. I personally, I've used about five different editing um, uh, systems or, or um, apps in, in the past. Um, my favorite by far is Edius. Edius allows you to use, to incorporate uh, drone footage, uh, stuff that you download online, the things that you shoot, uh, GoPro footage. Um, I think Edius by far is the easiest. And I do a lot of the graphics you guys saw in the introduction with all the, the locations that are coming down and then the numbers pushing out. That's all done via Edius. You can import pictures. Let's say you want to import a map and then you want to uh, put numbers on the map. You can do that. So Edius by far for me is the easiest and the best um, editing uh, software to use. And someone was asking how do you balance the time? Uh, don't get me wrong. It, it's not easy. Um, there, there's a lot. I mean, you know, I've been doing this for, uh, I started in 2002 right out of college. Um, and uh, a lot of mistakes that are made. And in fact, I, I've made some, I still make mistakes. Um, uh, there, I've, I, I've gone, you know, um, missed slots because I was trying to be too creative. The most recent one was uh, two, two Fridays ago or three Fridays ago. I was trying to do something that was really creative. Uh, it was the five, 6 p.m. for the Friday newscast. I was trying to do a bunch of graphics and try to be snappy, you know, sequences uh, to create movement. And I, I got floated. <laughs> so obviously, if you don't make the air, it sucks, right? Um, uh, but then sometimes I, uh, this story here, I'll show you one that um, made, well, that was also floated. Uh, but, you know, I, I was able to kind of maneuver, uh, air it again one more time. So, uh, you know, I, I try not, knock on wood, I try not to miss lots because if you miss lots so many times, you're going to be out of a job. Uh, but once in a blue moon, it does happen. Like I said, I don't do too many of these stories on a yearly basis, but when I do, you know, sometimes my heart's pounding. Uh, this story here, I'll, I'll, you guys saw it briefly, so. When it comes to crime and safety, Oakland is a tale of two cities. We're on Lake Merritt, the heart of Oakland, to my right, downtown, uptown, West Oakland, and all the way- I was trying to be too fancy with that, and, and I missed a lot with that one for actually, a little while. So, you know, uh, yeah, trying to balance uh, the question uh, Jose was asking, how to balance the time to make a story, you know, snappy and quality and all that stuff uh, doesn't always work, but when it does work, it's amazing. And you just got to manage your time. Um, I try to do no more than uh, three takes per stand up. You know, I basically, um, and this is kind of something that you guys can uh, try for yourself. Uh, I do close up or cutaways. These are 